Chris and all, welcome to the latest Fearless in Devotion. Uh, we've got a guest and we've got a new new member of the podcast return. Is he Andrew Pollard? How are you? Uh, very good. Yeah, thanks for the uh, extending the offer. Uh, hopefully uh, I don't turn people off too uh, too early. Well, yeah, we've we've managed to go through 160. So if you did come home and really balls it up, I w- would be pretty annoyed because you've you know ruined quite a long running, uh, quite running successful uh, podcast. But anyway, don't do that. Uh, basically, Andrew's coming in to to help us out uh, uh, on week to week, just uh, as a, another voice to this. Um, right, there's been some big news, some very big news. The only person we can go to on this is a guy synonymous. With, with what's happened. So, Andrew, what do you think about Afro? <laughs> I knew you were going to do that. <laughs> Come on, Tim. Come on, Tim. You've been you've been willing this. Oh, mate, it was just just glorious stuff. I mean, kind of news was emerging. What sort of Thursday night to Friday, and we were all getting getting the various murmurs like, "How true is it? How true is it?" And then it kind of became. Obvious that there's too too much going on between the lines for it not to be happening. So maybe the club caught wind of that, and decided, right, we'll do it at three o'clock on a Saturday with the, the weird kind of HP printer announcement thing, which we'll come to. But to get Arthur Conquo on a three year deal, make no mistake, it is one of the biggest biggest signings in the club's recent history. You could probably extend it out to quite a significant amount. Just in terms of milestone, like you get a player of that calibre, and we a lot of people thought there's no way he's going to come back. A lot of people looked into the body language and and his kind of supposed part in words. But when you're 22 years old and, and you've been at a club for as long as he has at Arsenal, was it 15 years? You're not going to say, oh yeah, I'm definitely going to come back. You have to go back and look at your options and, and figure out what the, the next move is. You're not just going to make a snap judgment like that. So he's really thought about it. And no doubt we've probably shattered the the wage structure to, to get him. Um, is it worth it? Very likely. The fact that he's now an asset, that you know, both in sort of monetary terms as well as the, the, the playing aspect, to get him at that length is massive. It shows a massive statement of intent by the owners. It wouldn't have been it wouldn't have been that easy. I know Arthur said there was no other, other offers on the table. And it was always Wrexham, but it still has to be right. It still has to be the right deal for for all involved. And yeah, I'm just overjoyed. I'm happy for him. And the fact is, it, it, it takes a little bit of stress off parking the rest of the lads. Now, we don't need to go scouring around for another goalkeeper to get them in, bedded in for the US tour. We've got somebody who knows the players. They know him. They all get on like a house on fire. It's massive. I'm delighted. Best goalkeeper I've seen at Wrexham since Andy Marriott. So yeah, absolutely buzzing. Thank you, Arthur, for staying, and thanks to everybody for getting that deal over the line. No, well done. Okay, you touched on it there, Andrew. Is he worth it? Because there's there's rumours that this could well, you know, it has shattered the wage structure. We're talking maybe maybe fifteen grand a week. Uh, I mean, who knows if it's that's up front or if it's a bit lower as a basic wage, and then the rest, and then the rest sort of as as bonuses. Um, yeah, basically, is he worth it? Uh for me, it's. In terms of as a player, yes, he's he's worth having that goalkeeper because he will be there for years to come. He's a exceptional goalkeeper. It's just it comes down to the financials. I think it's a it can be a, a dangerous precedent to set if you're spending fifteen grand a week on a player in League One. Um, so it's it I'm I'm really on the fence with this. Yes, I'm very excited to have him as a player at our club for the foreseeable future. But it's like what happens then with the other players at the club who want parity with his wages? What happens to new signings coming in thinking, well, I, I, I would have come in for maybe eight or nine grand. Now I'm looking at 15 or 14. And then what happens if if things did go wrong and then we've got a 15 grand goalkeeper in League One? Um, so it's, it's it's I don't know, it's, it's not, I'm not bittersweet. That's the, the wrong phrase. But it's just, yeah, I'm a little bit, a little bit split on this one. I, I'm, I'm great. I'm very I'm great. Too. I like this. You're already giving <laughs> to a needle. This is this is brilliant. This is exactly what we wanted. Yeah, um, I it's 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 a great signing for the club in terms of the player we're getting. I just think the financials for a League One club, yes, just because we can afford things sometimes doesn't mean you have to do every up one of those things. So it's um I'm 50 50. You know what, mate? I was looking at the signings we've been making over the last couple of years, right? And you've got Jack Marriott, 29 for a year deal. Um, you're sort of thinking 
I can understand why you're making that signing, but for the long-term future and planning of this club, that is not the signing that is going to really help us. Uh, and once we get to League One, we can't just go for sort of veterans after sort of uh, their last sort of big contract, uh, dependable people. We need something a little bit different. We need an X factor. And I think Okonko is that X factor. I think nailing a position like that uh, for, for three years, maybe maybe more. It's it that is the sort of star signing that we need to sort of show what our next sort of development or sort of you know sort of like a chrysalis is what, where we're going to go next. Signing a twenty two year old from from Arsenal. Now you know it's a free transfer, but let's look back to why it probably is a free transfer because he's a fantastic goalkeeper. Although he'll only get better. He's tall. His shot stopping's good. His command of the area will get better. His shouting's you know pretty pretty good. What he isn't, he's pretty good on the ball, but he's not Arsenal good enough on the ball, and that's why he wasn't given a new deal deal there. I think so. I think ordinarily for a player of that potential and that age you would probably have to pay a fee and you would probably have to pay one maybe two million pounds now the fact that we've got him on a free and yes the wages will reflect that but I think we've done a fantastic bit of business and I also think that yeah things might go wrong at Wrexham but you've still got a 23 24 year old keeper who's highly rated who has a sell-on value I definitely think Arthur now has that has that sort of sell-on value that which we need will need to grow the club because if he does well and he becomes a 10 million pound keeper and we sell him on then we've made all the stuff that we've given Jack Marriott that we've given Mullin that we've given Billy Waters comes back in one go one go you have to so, bring up Billy Waters. That just, I, I, yeah, I bl- no offense to Billy, I just kind of blanked that name out of my my head. It's the other side of the argument from what I'd said before was it, it is a statement of intent. So it's th- that's yeah. what I mean. It's uh, I'm I'm not conflicted as such, but it's just I don't know. I think it's the old Wrexham fan in me of like we're paying fifteen grand for someone per week in League One. This is crazy. It's what what yeah. would Mark Morris have got in today's uh, today's market? Yeah, oh, it's... not fifteen grand, mate. <laughs> <laughs> well, Andy on, Marriott, maybe. On, on that, on that. I think it's important, and I said this on the spaces the other day, it's important to kind of make sure that we, you know, the same fans who are saying, fucking hell, we're paying him X, Y, and Z, don't use the same stick to beat him with when we go on a run of six defeats and we've conceded 20 goals. Don't start saying, for the money he's on, he should be doing this, he should be doing that. That You can apply that logic to all those players if you really want to get picky about it. So I think it's important to clarify that now. We are going to have some lean moments this season. Guaranteed, there is no real benefit at all, any benefit in in making anybody a scapegoat because there was that little spells in there last season where he made a couple of clangers at Salford. But you're going to do that as a 22-year-old and how you come back from that tells you a lot more about a player and he did come back and he's walked away with another trophy. So just putting that out there. Yeah, yeah. Um... Right, we've waited till Liam's got on because I'm hoping Tim might have a song. Oh, I'm not too late, am I, lads? No, don't worry. Oh, we're shit. Late. <laughs> I, I just texted Liam and I said, "Look, you're 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 just bullshit, and you're having a massive shit on the toilet, hoping that I've done this song." Now, <laughs> there's a lot. There's there's been a lot of clamour for Book of a Cocker to be reopened, apart from obviously Andy oh, and Liam, who absolutely you. hate it. Andy Paul, Andrew Pollard is now going to spin his chair in disgust like in the Mighty Boosh when he just turns away in, in, in sort of, yes, the, you know the score. Um, so I want to thank everybody who, who has chucked in various um, suggestions. There was a, I can't remember off the top of my head, but there were some crackers. There was a New Kids on the Block one, um, which I'm not going to do um, just because I haven't rehearsed it. Instead, I made it in, infinitely more difficult for myself by coming up with a song that I thought, well, everybody likes Oasis for the most part. I'm not that arsed, but I, 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 I you know, I, I appreciate them. So in my infinite wisdom, I came up with something last minute. I had a light bulb moment about an hour ago. I was like, let's just go with this. And I know you're going to rinse me for it because it's shit. It's going to be hard to do. I've rehearsed it twice in the mirror in the bathroom. It's bad. It's bad. But, right. Let's let's see. Now, don't put me off here. Now, if you want to put your cameras, uh, you want to hide your cameras, then that's fine. I, I'm, I'm kind of on board with that. Um, let me just get the lyrics up because it's all <laughs> it's all <laughs> it's all about the lyrics. 
It's all about the lyrics, right? Okay, so here we go. Here we go. Okay. Okay, in the mood. Right, here we go. You know the song. I'll come in for your loud and clear, Mr. Pollard. Just thumbs up. Yeah, I've got it. Okay. You're going to get one minute, 30 seconds of this. It's going to be hard work. What? Glasses for rock star effect. Come on, Edwards. Think about it. Think about it. <clears throat> Is it my imagination? Or have we finally signed a player worth waiting for? Look at the disgust. Shocking. I was looking for Rob Layton, but all I found was McNicholas and a conk wall. Not finished yet. You can wait for a lifetime to sign a keeper in his prime. He dominates on the goal line. Cause when the shot comes in, you gotta save it, Arthur. You've gotta save it, Arthur. You've gotta save it, Arthur. You've gotta save it, Arthur. It, it, is that it? Thank you very much. Yeah. Did that did that just happen? That's like I'm in a fever dream, isn't it? Oh, yeah. God. I, I believe that was labelled a, a lightning bolt moment as well. <laughs> I'm, I'm still waiting for the lightning, Tim. <sighs> I can't believe you can't get over the, the lyrics. I was looking for Rob Layton, but all I, I like found that. was Nicola. Yeah, that was good. Quo. Well, sometimes yeah. I'll move my, I'll bob my head if there's if there's a little lyric I like in there. Sometimes think... you've got to put a bit of fluff around the magic, and I put the fluff right. around the magic, M like it's most Oasis songs. It was too long. That was my. my <laughs> was that? Are you anyway, talking about gold dedicate, lines? I'll, yeah, I, I like a gold. I'll dedicate. Crosses. I'll, I'll dedicate that to Arthur Conquo and my good friend John Davis, who's a huge, huge Oasis fan. So there we go. Um, Thanks for listening. Right. Sorry for ruining your canals, your ear canals. Cheers. And Shaker Maker. <laughs> yeah. Um. Right. Moving away, moving away from from Arthur, Liam. Um. Stephen Fletcher signed a one year deal. Uh, and big rumours of Joe Morrell, the uh, the uh, Welsh international uh, on a free from Portsmouth. Uh, wh where do you stand on both both those things? Uh, Fletcher signing a deal. See, I've got. So I keep saying this thing about it'd be great if you can come on, you know, play sort of last 20, 30 minutes, and then equally at the same time, I've been looking at our our striker numbers and. The one thing that concerns me is there's not much room in there. By the time we've got the likes of Billy Waters, uh, Bickerstaff, et al., I'm just wondering because I, I still think we need this. Etel, yeah. Uh, Samuel Etel, yeah. Um, oh, okay. <laughs> no, I think, I'm just thinking, you know, we need another starting striker, ideally. Yeah, um, so where, where are they going to fit in? Squad numbers... I know you don't have to have the exact squad numbers because obviously Parky could well do what he did last season and just not register some players. But I think it feels like we're quite heavy in that department. And I'm just wondering where the room is um, to fit people in there. Um, yeah, especially a 37 year old who can only play 20 minutes um, each each game, really. Yeah, yeah, it's not necessarily like that fitness wise, he can only play that. But I just thought that he looked better last season yeah, he's more as effective. an impact sub. Essentially, yeah. Yeah. Um, so uh, you know, I I think he'd, he's perfectly capable of playing that level and all that type of thing. But you know, when you talk about someone as if they're there to play 20, 30 minutes, can we really, you know, accommodate that? I do, I do absolutely love him as a player, but that's just my main my main concern on that one. Um, okay, Morel. I've had an update from Wonder Boy on 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 Morel, our good our good snout. Uh, I haven't quite quite bumped him off yet. Um, so Morel has interest from us, QPR and Birmingham, and it sounds like we're most likely to land him. Um, now I'd be really happy with that, to be honest. Um, he looks like the sort of midfielder that I think we need 
going up a level. Portsmouth have faffed around quite a lot over him by all accounts. They had an option to exercise an extension, didn't take it. Now they're saying, oh, we do like him, we want to offer him something. But I think I think they've left it a bit too late and it's triggered interest from other clubs. And that's another signing where I think, along with Arthur, that would be a signal of intent from us if we do manage yeah. to land him. So I'd be very happy with that. Tim, you've seen you've seen a lot of morale for Wales uh, with the hype. Uh, yeah, uh, I think he's um, very, very, very clever, clever player. Um, I think it's a weird one because I think people look at him and go, "Well, the greatest respect to Andy Morrell, it might not be a sort of sexy name that that we're that we're getting in, but he's just very good at what he does." You know, lest we forget, he's just helped Portsmouth get promoted. Um, could have stayed. Um, he's just, he's just very, very, very. He's just a very intelligent player. Very clever his passes. Doesn't give the ball away very easily. Low center of gravity. I think I remember. I think I saw him sort of bully Luka Modric in a game once. I mean, people saying, "Well, who's he going to get in ahead of?" Well, that, this is the whole purpose of having a squad depth, isn't it? It's the whole purpose of having that there. You know, um, people said that George Evans was great last season. He was, but. If you're going to get players to come in and push those that are in, you better make sure they're of, of an equivalent level, if not better. So, it, I mean, from, from a personal point of view, it's it, obviously you know what I'm like with Welsh representation from Rex, and for me, it's massive in that sense. So, and I think I think whoever comes in as Wales boss now, which we'll discuss in a minute, you know, they'll look at that and go, well, "Where's he playing his trade? Oh, he's playing his trade there. How is he doing? Doing really well, thank you." You know, and if it, he's going to have to come in oust some of these other solid midfielders and go, well, this is why I'm here. I'm here to kind of get back into that frame, into that sort of Welsh shop window and prove his worth. Yeah. And we, he's somebody that's been there and done it in and around mostly League One, a little bit of championship, but mostly League One. He's going to know that division. He's going to know what it takes. He's been around there for plenty of years now. So I think if we get him, which I'm confident we will, I think it's a very, very good signing. And I think at this stage, um, it's kind of, Quality over quantity, very important. Yeah, I mean, yeah, deceptively right. quick as well. Right. So yeah, there is a twenty-two man squad. Uh, I mean, Andrew, how would you sort of see? Say we did get Morel, how would you see that midfield three lining up? I I'd see him more in in uh, I guess competition with say an Andy Cannon um, more than a, a George Evans. I think George Evans is your your staple there, your rock, uh, and then. I think uh, it'd be more like the the energy role alongside him. The I, I guess effectively an upgrade on Luke Young. Luke Young's obviously left this summer, and it'd be that sort of player, just obviously several steps ahead of Youngy um, in terms of ability and, and awareness. And that's no dis- disrespect to Luke Young, a great servant of the club. Just when we're going up to League One and looking maybe further beyond, you need uh, someone that that does that job but better, uh, frankly. And I think I think it'd be that sort of role for me. Um, it's, it's very exciting signing. It's what thirty seven caps for Wales. Where it's just just that on on, it, on its own is like. Oh, this is this is really exciting. Um, the fact that well, last time we had Welsh international be, I guess Mark Jones, Chris Llewellyn, Stevie Evans, um, around that time. So yeah, it's it's a really it it kind of it captures the imagination. I think it's a, a really exciting name to be to be linked with, and especially as a Welsh club. Yeah. Um. Right. We've got a guest who's coming on in, in a minute. He's going to tell us a, a lot more about Welcome to Wrexham. But let's quickly talk about about Wales while we're waiting for him. Tim, whoever comes in, do you think their first sort of move will be to 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 get Mullin in? And who who do you think will who who are you looking towards? Are you in the Oshan Robbins camp, or are you thinking someone a little bit more high profile, as in, in like a, a big ex player? Um, I think whoever comes in will have to obviously quite rightly assess the squad at their disposal, realise that we're not exactly um, thumping in goals for the fun of it, give one or two matches. So it'd be it'd be wrong of him not to con- consider him. It depends. I mean, you know, we, we, there's no matches now until the, the Nation Nation League's game in September. So if Mullin starts the season on fire, you know, and they look at that and go, well, he's just scored six in four at League One and he, he's picked up where he's left off again. So why wouldn't you look at him? You know, so <laughs> we'll, we'll we'll see on that front. Who do I think is going to come in? Oshin Roberts is probably a sound, uh, a sound <clears throat> appointment. Whether he fancies it, I don't know. It's kind of one of those classic cases where you get people who, who just like being assistants and never really enjoy the whole idea of taking overall responsibility. Um, Craig Bellaby has been mentioned. I don't 
think is whilst they command the respect of the players, I and this is the greatest respect to Craig Bellamy. I, I just don't think he's in the right place for it. It was in a lot of documented sort of mental health stuff, and I'm not saying that would have a, a an overbearing effect, but I think given the pressure that's on the Welsh job at the moment and the scrutiny that whoever comes in is under, it's probably not the best time for him to do that. I think we'll end up with the first foreign manager since Bobby Gould. So it's going to be... It's been Bobby a while. Gould, Bobby Gould said he was Welsh, didn't he? Fucking uh, really sick, wasn't he? Really sick. Um, so I, I haven't got a clue. I mean, Rob Edwards would have been good, but he's just committed himself to Luton. Steve Cooper would have been even better. But, you know, he signed, signed to become Leicester manager the day before um, the FAW pulled the trigger on Rob Page. Everybody knows unanimously, for the most part, that firing Page was probably the right thing to do at this time. Who we get in? I, I genuinely don't know. I just it could be a completely left field appointment. They might end up going for something silly like I don't know Graham Potter or something. I, I genuinely don't know. Genuinely don't know. But whoever comes in, they're, they're going to inherit a very talented squad. So you know the the foundation is there for them to be successful. Right. We've been joined by our guests, so we're going to sort of switch our focus to talk more about Welcome to Wrexham. Uh, Jeff, before we st- before I give you a bit of an intro, how do I say your second name, just so I don't get it wrong? Uh, you, you're on mute, mate. I want to interrupt you guys. I said Luini, like a fine Luini. pasta. Oh, okay. All right. Okay. Uh, sorry, Jeff, I've got some bad news for you. You've missed the singing. Tim did uh, one minute, 30 seconds of an Oasis track. He can do it again for you if you want. Yeah. To counter that, Jeff, Andy has been calling you Looney for the last two weeks. No, no I, that's why that's, I bloody asked. That's, that's what that, this is I what asked. makes me uh the playground is what makes me a strong man growing up. <laughs> I heard everything, man. If I grew up in Italy, different story, but growing up in Northern California, anything you can think of. I but I have a, a a deal with people when they first meet me, which is like, go ahead, if you want to come up with a clever nickname for me, that's fine. If I've heard it before, I'll if if it's original. I will pay you ten dollars, but if I've heard it before, you owe me five. I usually come out ahead. Oh, okay. Well, well nice one for grassing me there, Tim. Snitches get stitches, by the way. I'm watching That's right. you. That's right. Uh, right. Okay. We're here with Jeff Luini, uh, who, right? I've, I've had a look on his IMBD page, and apparently, he's a great conversationalist. And I think we've had a bit of a we've had a bit of a blast of that already. So I'm, I'm really looking <laughs> forward to this one. He's one of the many producers. Welcome to Wrexham. He's the best producer because he's here. Uh, and he's going to give us a little bit behind the scenes of, you know, what makes everyone's favorite show about a mining town with a giant slag heap in Wales. The thing it is. Um, basically, Jeff, we, we just want to talk about Steve Parkin and how he's the breakout star of season three. But we also want to know how you guys made season three for what I think is the best one yet. Thanks. Well, I, I got to tell you that I'm on the Steve Parkin chain train right there. I've been pushing. We have some stuff in the can on the floor. Um, what's fun about this whole process is, you know, we have our, our people on the ground, you know, Patty and Gaz and the whole group over there who, who deal with things on a daily basis. And then, you know, there's those of us here back in the States like Brian Rowland, Josh Trisco. And Cody Shelton, Andy Thomas, I got to say all the names because it is truly a group effort. And so the fun part is coming up with questions, you know, for interviews to sort of prompt. And, and one of the people we really wanted to dig into this year was Steve Parkin. So writing up the questions was for Steve was really fun. Um, we'll get to him next year for sure. You know, we, we, we introduced him. Um, I think there's a group of us who's trying to uh, make some uh, some T-shirts that uh, just say weak as piss. Um, favorite term. I use it in daily life now. I know it's a it's a normal uh, expression in the UK, but it comes in so handy on a daily basis over here. Um, yeah. But uh, yeah, season three. You know, coming into coming off of season two, which was I think we were fifteen episodes then, uh, um, and, and it would made up ten hours of programming. And then for season three, because we're doing a little bit of an accelerated release, which you saw, you know, there was some urgency that we wanted to address. Uh, Rob, uh, really, that was one of his mandates. Uh, and so we knew we were going to have to sort of come up with a different format, which was really committing to eight one hour episodes. So, you know, there's not a lot of stories you can tell in that amount of time. And we're sort of guessing ahead of time, you know, up on the whiteboard, up with the cards, trying to see like how we can tell all these stories and, and not leave anything behind. Like I said, Steve Parkin 
you know, we're going to, we're fortunate to have a season four, so we're going to get a little deeper into him, hopefully. Um, but one of the things and I'm, I'm all over the board here is because of the consistency that we have with our team, as far as producing the show, it really helps a lot because we're already sort of hit the ground running and we're already looking in, you know, the summer before summer of 2023, we're trying to figure out, you know, we've sort of told a lot of Wayne's story from the turf. We've told some stories from other people. And, and so we want to look for new people uh, because, you know, I, I love Rob's point about everybody has a story to tell everybody, you know, all y'all had a week and I'm sure there's something that happened in this week. That's an interesting story to, to someone out there. So it's just trying to find the, the people and their stories and the people who, you know, they have to sort of be compelling on camera. We can help with that to an extent, but uh, yeah, getting into season three, we knew that the great thing about season two, we knew the King was coming. So that was a great way to kick off the season. Season three, we knew we'd gonna have the summer tour. Um, this club gifts us storylines. We could not, you know, if you tried to do this in scripted, I also do scripted. Um, people would accuse you of going to cliche so easily. And, you know, with, with Paul and what happened in San Diego, that, you know, terrible for the team. But from a story standpoint, we knew at least we're kicking off the season with something that seems unbelievable and, and, and easy to predict, but it just fell into our laps. So, um, so we were off and running and the way that the season started, which was, you know, the perfect thing, like, welcome to the EFL. You, you're, we're excited and you just come out there and you get kicked in the teeth. So we knew at that point, all right, we have the beginning, you know, how can we climb this mountain? Jeff, we're probably going to bo uh, boil down into, into the episodes in a bit, but can right. I take you back first? Um, looking on your, on, on your page, 15, 16 seasons of It's Always Sunny in Philadelphia. How did you first meet Rob? Did you get his surname right straight away? Absolutely. Are you kidding me? You know, I'm very well prepared for my interviews. Trust me. Um, <laughs> I, I was I was fortunate. I had a nice I've had a, a long run, you know, as far as like this industry is a marathon. I've been a freelancer most of my life, which means as your show goes, so goes your income. And um, there's been highs and lows. And leading up to before Sunny, I was fortunate to do the, a pilot for a show called Arrested Development. I'm not sure if you guys are familiar with that. Oh, oh, I'm and, a huge Arrested Development fan. Yeah, so that was something that was on my resume that some people on Sunny, they had done season one without me. I don't know how. Um, and then they were bringing in someone new for season two. And fortunately, Arrested has sort of set a template stylistically for how you shoot uh, with cameras, a little improvisational based. And, you know, Rob, Charlie and Glenn were rel respectfully, relatively green, and they worked outside the studio system. So me being able to come in and sort of help them. And it's not like they needed help, but navigating things and basically filtering out the bullshit that they didn't have to deal with. And the way that they do things, and we've always done things is just because you can doesn't mean you have to. You don't have to have the fanciest equipment and spend the most money when you're a show like Sunny. Stylistically, you know, we're a little dirty, a little gritty, and we're late to the party on a lot of things when it comes from the technological standpoint. So um, I learned that the way they did things was a lot more efficient than traditional methods. And so um, when I was brought in, it was a really sort of refreshing place where I was able to have a little bit more influence because the guys sort of said, hey, you know, tell us what we need to do. We need to write, act and produce. And so uh, that was, you know, and I love the show. Um, yeah. so fortunate to be on it. And so you have this, you, you get this working relationship with the guys and figure out like putting everyone in the best position to succeed. What's interesting is I mentioned Josh Frisco, Josh, who's a EP on, on Wrexham and one of our showrunners, he was the editor of the original Sunny pilot. So Josh and I have worked together on Sunny going back all those years. I think I came in in like 2005. So it's just a really interesting development for the two of us from him from the editorial side meant me from sort of a post oversight and then all of a sudden here we are both big sports fans working on Rex and, and helping craft story for that standpoint so um yeah super fortunate with sunny kept going we didn't know as a little engine that could didn't have much light shined on us uh it was a different world back then before streaming and, and each year we'd, we'd get a pickup and we'd get to do some more episodes and i mean 
like I said, I've been, been so fortunate. And, and the key point is sort of, I live in this world where to me, like uh, social connection is really important. And to me, laughing together is, is part of that. Rooting for a club together is part of that. I'm very much into like live music. And so these are all circumstances I've sort of learned this about myself where that's what sort of feeds my soul. Um, but this boy's boy soul. Um, <laughs> uh, and so that's, that, that's what Sonny served. And, and, you know, you, you earn trust over time with people and, um, and that's what, what's been great with Rob, Charlie and Glenn and, and, yeah. and Rob giving opportunities. Yeah. I mean, obviously you, Rob's very loyal. He, he obviously trusts you, the likes of you and Josh and your work and wanted to bring you on, onto something like welcome to Rex. And was there a big sort of buzz around it? And were you a soccer f- football fan beforehand? I, oh, I've been a football fan my whole life. I call it football. I one of a few people in Good. California who called it that many, many, many years ago. I was, I grew up, uh, I had friends who lived down the street and we watched the show. I can't remember what it was called, but it was on like, public television and I remember I believe Toby Charles was the host and it was German football and I remember him talking about Muchen Gladbach and we'd watch this football and I had my Gerd Moller boots as a young kid um and so yeah I was I was fortunate to be in LA in 94 for the World Cup and I volunteered for that so I was there in the stadium uh for the famous own goal when Colombia had the own goal against the US which guy eventually got oh, that's in Colombia yeah. Um, I was there when Baggio had the free kick uh, to decide PKs versus Brazil and sailed it over the bar and my Missouri lost. Um, so, yeah, I've been a big fan for a long time. I was a Gunners fan, but I, I know not to be too much of a fan there. The second you try and you know, think they're going to get there, now I know they're not. Um, so, yeah, I'm a huge fan, played myself. You know, one of the things, well, I'll get into that later. But uh, so, yes, huge fan. Um, I, I just, it's the beautiful game, you know, and when I've traveled around the world, I've been, been fortunate to see, you know, matches at Ajax and, uh, and Benfica. I saw PSG with Messi and Neymar and Mbappe playing in Benfica. So yeah, I'm a, I'm a huge fan, but going back to the origins of Wrexham, I mean, I'm such a fan that we were working on Mythic Quest. I think it was 2019 when Rob was first talking about purchasing the club and Humphrey was a writer and an actor on Mythic Quest. And Josh was one of our editors and we were cutting. I remember Josh, you know, a lot of times we'll come in, Rob will have projects that are in their early stages and he'll bring them into editorial because we'll have to cut sizzle reels, something like that to sort of help sell, sell it. So I remember ripping things from the internet, Josh trying to put together the sizzle reel really early on to sell this, hopefully the show Welcome to Wrexham. And at that time when I became aware of it, um, actually they had already sold it to the production company and so i reached out just on my own to humphrey and the showrunner at the time offering my services i i have these emails going back to 2019 where i i was like how can i be a part of this and i'll i'll, I'll consult i have ideas and you know the feedback i got was sorry jeff it's a, a small engine and we really don't have room for you on this and i said great you know i'll be rooting from the side and lo and behold they went off and they sort of worked on it for a while rob was never really never intended to be part of the creative he knew he'd be on camera and rob just can't help himself uh the network and and company started sending him cuts and that was in may of whatever year we premiered it must have been 2022 and there were some things that he felt needed addressing and he came into my office and that was right around it's just after COVID. we were back to work and uh, and he said, hey, I think we need to take this over. Do we have the infrastructure here to sort of take all this media and recut all these episodes? And I looked around and I love a challenge with Rob. Anytime you say you can't do something, he's gonna find a way to do it. And all of a sudden I was working on the show. And um, the first season was a lot of barely making deadlines, throwing a lot of scenes that people had done really good work, but it was just the way it was constructed in the episodes. That's why it went from 10 one hour episodes to at season one was like 18, I think we ended up with, with a combination of one hour and a half hours. And so that was really fun and challenging to you know, reconfigure all that material and come out with those episodes. And after that, by season two, I was given the opportunity, you know, Josh and myself and, and Brian 
Roland were given the opportunity to sort of come in and help show run. And that's when we hit the ground running because it was sort of clean slate at that point. Yeah. I mean, before I hand it over to, to the guys, because everyone's fed up of me talking, um, basically, the tonal changes of, of one, two, and three. I think one, you have to sort of, season one, you have to really paint the picture of the town and maybe add some other, other stuff in about, about Wales to really sort of set the scene for, for a US viewer. Two was very much community based. Three, I think, was very much more on the football. Was that. Was that always the plan, or did you just happen to have a season that ebbed and flowed, started badly, was a bit of a roller coaster? So that became the main sort of drive of the narrative. Uh, I think yes, part of it was we were gifted that. You know, if we didn't, if we were mid table, we're we're always talking about that. Like, let's go into season four. Where are we going to be? No huge signing yesterday. I mean, to me, that's huge having Arthur back. Um, to me, all of a sudden, we go from all right, maybe we're mid table to now playoffs are realistic. That's a big man standing in goal who has a lot of skills. So if he can get some support on the back, you know, anything can happen. So um, we're football is the primer. You know, that's, that's what we all can. Here's the thing for me, like sort of my whole life in, in storytelling, I love sports because you're going to see grown men and grown women crying from joy and ecstasy and crying from joy and from pain and defeat. That's the great thing about it. And you can't script it. So I'm constantly in my life. I have my, my partner. <laughs> she is not as into sports as I am. So I'll be watching something and I want her to experience the same way I'm experiencing that, be it in, in football or basketball, or whatever it is. And I'm always putting things into context. I'll be like, Hey babe, come in here and watch this. This guy just, you know, uh, got a yellow card and he was running around and, and he's being booed by the fans, but watch how he turns out and he scores this gold and trying to sort of build the stakes for her. And what's great is now we get to do this on a weekly basis. So to me, you got to look back to what's happening on the pitch. You know, the, the other thing to me is, you know, I don't know if you guys have watched ESPN over there. You have top 10 every night. So you will see 70 amazing plays every week from all different sports. So how do we sort of get the attention and tell these stories that makes it compelling because you we are just bombarded with all these amazing achievements in sports so it's the stories behind it it's building you know there's always stakes but it's building those stories so going back to i think we know in the back of our we, we have what we call sort of the graveyard sometimes which a lot of story on the board and and and, and we go okay something great happened on the pitch that we know we're going to fit into this episode now so these little cards go over to the graveyard maybe we'll bring them back but as long as this team is giving us the stories that are compelling then you know thank you very much let's look at season two compared to season three with the cup fa cup season two was tremendous great stories season three we were primed we were ready and then it wasn't so great so it wasn't much of a story to tell we abandoned it hopefully season four is a different story so and and another thing you know just like we were talking about like finding out those people who you're not so aware of like steve parton parkin i'll keep saying that the guys if if they watch it they know what i say i've been saying this since week one i need to know more about steve he's such a great guy but you see him at the beach in the finale sorry but no I mean, no well I, I mean i don't even think he was wearing that for a bet i think no. that is just gen general steve parkin clobber um, it's, it's my Halloween costume this year, that's for sure. <laughs> Andrew, yeah. you that, yes, and his salute, I man, in that montage, our, our editor who cut that, put that <laughs> in there, I said, that's staying forever. It's amazing. It's gift worthy. That 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 salute oh. is gift worthy. Him and his loose as goose and getting that skip, it's just gold. Everything he comes yeah. out with yeah. is gold. So if there's a standalone Steve Parker episode, we're all for it. I follow that man. Andy, what are you going to say then? Sorry, I'll cut you up. No, just going to hand over to Andrew to, to sort of uh, drill down into the episodes a little bit more. Yeah, no worries. I mean, my notes, literally, I'm not even taking the mic here, say Steve Parkin, weak as piss. That is, they are my notes at the moment. There's a bit more to it than that. But but yeah, what, what a man. I'm forget a spin-off episode. I want a spin-off season. You, you get it in, you know, normal TV shows. I want I want like a whole episode, a whole season of Steve Parkin just being Steve Parkin. But uh, Jeff, in terms of the... I guess you talked before about things left on the cutting room floor. Episode one, 
Vegas, you must have seen some sights. Um, who, who enjoyed Vegas the most, and and what what can you tell us about what didn't make the cut? I, I can't say we we honor the request, you know, from Rob and Ryan early on is like no cameras go to mm -hmm. Vegas. If you look there, a lot of that stuff was uh, sourced from social. Yeah. We went back and looked through social. We want to, I mean, listen, cameras are everywhere now. I feel bad for a lot of people, people who are recognizable, who can't go out in public and just act a fool for a little bit without being judged by everybody. So we left them alone. And um, it looked, I would just say, look, look at the episode and you'll see who had the most fun. <laughs> you know, I love it when Fozzie is sort of telling all the stories. So, by the way, I saw him pop up. He he was at a match yesterday in Euros. I saw them yeah. cut to him the other day. Um, yeah, England game wasn't it? But, was yeah, it was but I, here, here's, um, it was our young man um, who who's able to go back this year, you know, and be of legal age. That hopefully this year um, <laughs> we'll have some something to feature on him. Yeah, I imagine Max is going to enjoy himself a lot more this time uh, than, than maybe last time due to... I hope so. But yeah, so leaving the cameras off and letting them hopefully get a little bit crazy without, you know, cameras are on them so much. And we know at the end of the year, you know, Patty will tell us, you know, we'll be like, well, after the last match, what can we get? And it's like, you know, yeah. everyone just goes off and does their thing till it's time to come back together for the tour. Summer yeah. Tour. And obviously, there's like a, a compared to the other the previous two seasons, there's a a change of tone pretty early on because obviously the MK Dongs game where we get get turned over five three. There's there's fans leaving the stadium early. There's booze. Um, how was it to, to capture that? Because for anyone that's been been around for just say the the previous two seasons, the previous two two seasons in terms of TV and in terms of football, it's been a very fairly you know we win more games than we lose and we win a lot of games. But then all of a sudden now it's like all oh, right, this isn't going all our way all of a sudden. I think we needed that for the series, honestly, because at some point, you know, we're going to have people who root against us just because of the nature of the show and, and the coverage, which is fine. Um, we need, you need to get kicked in the teeth once in a while. You need to feel down to feel the highs. So were we worried? Of course, we don't want to be, I mean, going back to being selfish for the show, what's the best story? Fighting relegation or seeking promotion. Again, going back to like mid table, that's hard to tell the great stories there. So at least from the beginning, as storytellers or documentarians were saying, well, we have a story and there's nothing better than redemption. I mean, my, I remember the first time I saw Rocky. It's so funny that Rob always mentions Rocky because to me, that was my moment as a kid where I realized someone makes this. Someone has jobs making this. And so just this whole story and, and sort of the parallels that Rob makes with the town and Philly and Rocky and the whole thing. I mean, this is perfect. Listen, I come from Northern California where my teams, we've had some highs, we've had some lows, but you know, as what I know is as the teams go, so does the town. And specifically I'm talking about Oakland. And if you know anything about Oakland, they took the Raiders at the height and they moved them to LA, which is like our, our rivals. We hate LA from Northern California. Um, they take the Warriors after they win three championships and they move them across the Bay, build them a new stadium, take them from Oakland, which is sort of blue collar and put them in San Francisco and Silicon Valley. The A's have just been abandoned the baseball team. They're moving them to Vegas. So I know that firsthand, I go back to those towns and I see them and, and so this is what connects with me and how sports will you know, we'll, we'll bring people together who where we can sing in unison with 40,000 people or 12,000 people at the race course who can't get along if you step outside that stadium or, you know, during the week. But this one thing can bring us all together. So just the power of that. So going back to it's it's a group. What the fuck when you get punched like that? And are you going to stay with your team? And you're going to keep rooting or are you going to turn on them? Because people are going to turn quick. We know, well, I'll, I'll wait for you to get into later episodes. But, you know, people jump off the wagon quickly. It's it's fun to ride to bandwagon. So, you know, let's see how fast people will jump off that bandwagon who enjoyed the win after win after win, especially in season two.
yeah um it comes it, out like that yeah it's, it's almost like the that's like a, a tiny capsule of being a Wrexham fan is in you talk about getting punched down and then th that's what makes the highs uh, well the highs and it is it's kind of that's that's the Wrexham story especially the, the past what 15 years before that where it's like yeah 15 years of mainly dross to then that's when you do get the promotions you do win the titles that's when it's you can that's what makes them special because you've gone through so much shit basically uh you mentioned parallels a little bit earlier Oliver Stephen in, in episode two, the photographer, almost feels like a, a little bit like a para, parallel, sorry, for, for yourselves in that he's, whatever reason, has ended up with Wrexham, uh, shine the spotlight on it, moved to the town, discovered the passion of the place. Uh, I think he puts it as beautiful and bleak, uh, which is just a really nice way to put it. And it kind of feels, like I said, like a, a smaller way of what you've done yourselves with the documentary. Yeah, that was someone who was brought to our attention over the summer. And there are a few of us who really fought to get his story in. That was tough because he was in some episodes and he was taken out. One of the things, and I'll go back to Oliver in a second. One of the things that I respect about the way that Rob and Ryan run the show is they really try and keep us to a certain runtime, even though that the platforms now, if you watch a lot of things, things will just go 28 minutes, 35 minutes for a quote unquote half hour show. Maybe they'll go an hour 13 for an hour show. We really try, they try and keep us for our hour shows in the range of like 42 to 45 minutes. So what does that do? It makes you distill down till you have the gold and you're throwing things out or forced to cut things. And ultimately, and we do this on Sunny a lot of times, we'll cut eight minutes out of an episode. And if you've seen it, you feel like you miss it. But as a viewer, you never knew it was there. So with Oliver specifically, um, he was in and then we had to take him out for time. and. I know, like I said, there was myself and a couple other people were really fighting to put him in there because we felt that was such a compelling story. So um, to get him back in there was huge. And yeah, I mean, he recognizes the town for me as an outsider. And like you just said, bleak, but beautifully bleak. And it's his bleak. And and there's something about it that, you know, if you, if you have something in your day that gives you something that's enriching or something call it good that happens in the day then you're going to hopefully get up tomorrow because there's hope and you see what he's been through and there he opened up a lot you know again i give a lot of credit to patty uh patrick mcgarvey who to really forge this relationship and and we interviewed him a couple of times and he was very forthcoming in his struggles and there's some stuff in there again that is on the cutting room floor um one of the things to me that was really anyone who has you know family for him it was his nephew and his niece i think that sort of gave him hope and to, he wanted to demonstrate to them that if i can get through something you can which i think is a lesson to all of us and we really wanted to get him uh, get his uh, nephew and niece to a match with him we thought that would have been fun but sometimes things don't align yeah um I'll, I'll, i'm gonna stick with the second episode before we move on to the rest of the the, the season uh ben foster obviously his retirement that's featured in in episode two it's, it's stepping away it's a very brief period that ben foster had was well, this time a second time around it was 16 games over the, the end of the prior season the start of this past season obviously had a massive impact during that time in particular not to count you penalty save it's always gonna that's gonna, that, that has gone down in rest of history how important was it to give fozzy the chance to have a bit of a, a sit down a send off properly uh, really important. We chased him down because, I mean, I, I understand where he's coming from. Like, this is this is something where you played for your whole life. You come back, you feel, you get a taste of of what brought you there in the first place, and then you realize it's gone. You you don't have it. And, you know, we said in the show, and we have people talking about, like, it takes a lot of class to step away because he could have kept coming, stepping out on that pitch, and he knew, he knew his time was over, and we chased him down to like the last moment of when that episode had to lock and deliver. It literally had a placeholder in there because we knew we had to get him. And, you know, Fozzie is a, he's a busy guy. You know, he, he can, he has full rights to go off and live his life once he's done with football. And, um, you know, I, I remember we were all reaching out to him and just getting ghosted. And then, boop, he popped right up and we got that last interview and it was, it was so, it was perfect like to put him in the chair and he's so comfortable in his own skin and you know he says the things where you know there are people who are i would say media savvy media trained uh, certainly he is but he certainly came off as his authentic self in that last interview which i think 
a lot of athletes can learn from. I just watched like the Federer piece. Uh, that's a new doc that's out here. And um, that seemed very produced to me. You know, the guy's amazing. But again, what you get from Fozzie, I think he's authentically himself, which is which is how he fits into the show and how he fits into like the culture at, at Wrexham. Yeah. Um, so, one, one last question for me before I switch over to the other guys. I've rewatched a few episodes today ahead of, of this. And it kind of struck me, for for the most part, why is Paul Mullen the only person that gets subtitled? Is that, is that like a thing against Scousers, it feels like? Dude. No comment. <laughs> right. No, you know what? Uh, James McLean also, specifically. Right, okay. You know, we try... Season one, we over-subtitled. I mean, there's, there's, there's originally the thinking that, like, if anybody has any trouble understanding what's what someone's saying... We're yeah. going to sub. But then we realized that there's a whole generation of people, especially on streaming, who just have the subs on all the time. So why would we burn that into the master? And so we pulled a lot back. If you look at season one and compare it to season two yeah. and season three, and I think it is because you know he's a scouser. you got to remember also what I love about this show, going back to like telling stories is, you know, we can all see the drama. You know, we're huge sports fans, but... You know, I've worked on a lot of shows where my family doesn't watch them that, you know, Sonny or like Arrested. And they'll say, you know, when can you work on something that I like with this show, which I think speaks to, you know, what our group has done here is I have my daughters who watch the show and I have my mother who watches the show. And it's funny, she'll my mom specifically, she'll say, oh, I, I it, it took me a little while. I had to sit so close to the TV so I could read the subtitles. So. Maybe we're doing it for my mom. I'm not, I, I say, figure it out. You know, these, we're all speaking. No one subtitles me. I'm probably hard to understand to some people, so. Um, sorry, Jeff, before I hand you on to, to Liam to go through another couple of episodes, there's one thing I wanted to just just bring up. So sometimes when, as a football fan now and as a Wrexham fan, something will happen uh, in the season. I go, that's going to be great on the documentary. Um, and one thing that I thought would have been great on the documentary is uh, there's a player that we nearly signed called Luke Armstrong. And mm -hmm. I think there was a lot of sort of toing and froing, and the paperwork didn't go through at the time. And I was thinking, I can't wait to see this bit. I can't wait to see sort of Geraint huddled over a, a fax machine and, and shouting down the phone to the FAW. That, that didn't make the cut. Was a was that just because there wasn't that footage there? Or, or was that something the club yeah. didn't really want to... No, no, the, the club was open to it. Um, we had, it made it very far down the line in, in different episodes also. And I think, again, there, there are a lot of us who were fighting for it and it was a casualty of time. And again, you're, you're right. I mean, I can tell you, we were tracked down. We were tracking down like, what would the Wrexham, can we get a shot of the Wrexham, the, the fax machine in the office? You know, we had placeholders in there. So everything you're saying is right. And we had a, we had a whole package on Luke. Um, and we had people talk, speaking to it, but it just wasn't very compelling. You know, in hindsight, when you, when you, you saw what else was there, I think the story outside, like you guys were aware of, like, we were ready. We we're like, we're going to get this guy. And when it fell out, we had the same thing. This was, was that last July, I think? I think that's when the window was. And so we had already flagged that and identified that this is going to be a big story. And it just wasn't able to be captured on camera in a story told where we thought the audience would really understand the impact. I think it would have helped. You know, I think Luke, after that, like that messed with his head or wherever, wherever he was. And it was like, how do we tell that story? We want to be respectful to this man because, you know, he's sort of living outside of our uh, ecosystem as far as Rexman's, you know, sort of doing a piece about him. And so the fact that subsequently he did not play very much. And so it was hard to, if he had some sort of impact and we said, oh, wow, look at all these goals that he scored. And these could have been our goals. But it was just sort of a story that petered out a little bit. To your point, though, yeah, if something like that happens again, we're following that all the time. Um, just coming up. Uh, Jeff, on to episode three, which is um, Knots again. Um, so we start off with revisiting with the women's team who are now in the Adram Premier. We see some familiar faces with the likes of um, Rosie Hughes, Lily Jones. But what I actually quite like about 
um, this episode is we also get to see someone who didn't make it in Mia Roberts. Um, and you know, you talk about bits that get missed out. One thing that doesn't get missed out in all this is you know how she actually found out that she she didn't make the cut. Now, if this was sort of you know like a cheerleading piece for the club, you you could just say that would that would have got cut. But clearly, you guys are quite happy to get involved in the tough stuff, which doesn't always uh, necessarily reflect well on the club. Yeah, we let I mean, uh, Robo. She's she's so great. I mean, to, she's I think wise beyond her years. I think again, that's just someone who's comfortable in her skin, and she's not shying away away from the cameras when things aren't so great. Um, and I think, you know, when we learned how she learned about that, we knew that was a story. I'll again give our uh, co-chairman credit for shining a light on that. I think Rob in a subsequent episode even tells uh, me his dad, you know, like, hey, that was screwed up. I found out the wrong way. And th I think this is an example of, you know, being new and what you don't know, you don't know and sort of learning from mistakes. So yeah, that's messed up. You know, I. I like to think of some of these characters as like, what if these were your kids and how would you feel about that? They need to be treated a certain way. And uh, Mia has been, you know, so great for the club, so uh, willing to participate. And so let's shine a light on that. And again, I'll give the guys credit that that was not edited out. It wasn't the best look for the show. And, you know, we leaned into that. So I'm not patting ourselves on the back, but yeah, thanks for noticing that. Because yeah. that's something that we feel, you know, we can't just be, you know, uh, Pollyannas. Yeah, because I think, you know, people sort of, it, you want it to be warts and all, but it's also, it was also quite well handled as well. We got to see what her journey was afterwards because, you know, f some of these stories, there's not always going to be a, a happy ending, is there? You know, you get some players who don't make it, but also I think what you showed quite well is there was life, life after football as well for her. I mean, I trust that's happened to all of us, right? At one point in our whatever sport it is you pursue, unless you reach the top echelon, someone tells you you're not good enough. And that yeah. sucks. And, and and hopefully, you know, life moves on. Yeah, also, I, thought, I really like the way that this episode dealt with sort of another quite tough theme in um, Man's Health. I must admit that um, Sam Cattardia wasn't really, we've, we've had him on the podcast, he was really great to speak to but not someone that I'd in encountered. How do you go about sort of teasing out those characters that, you know, even quite committed fans might not be aware of? Um, well, when it came to Dan Rowe, he was in someone else who was brought to our attention. We knew we wanted to do something that had to do with mental wellness, mental health. And I'm trying to remember, we had seen some stuff maybe on Facebook about Andy's Man Club. We'd seen some other organizations and so we knew there was a, a through line there as far as like, how do we connect this to the team and the fact that, you know, these men get together again, what's bringing us together. We're talking about mental health, which how, how much is that related to being a football club supporter? They're sort of a little mutually exclusive, but it's a place where people come together. And because our commonality, because we, our passion is similar. Now I can talk to about things outside of my passion. So that was another thing just like the oliver piece where it was in and out multiple places you know it was it was in cuts it was taken out and that was another one where if we have an opportunity to me the one of the huge messages from that and we sort of tie it together at the end of the episode was i loved how dan mentioned you know he went off he was at the pits he was at the bottom and he went into this meeting and he wasn't it's not like it's going to heal you immediately it's not going to, it's going to drastically change your life, but he felt 1% better. And to me, that's something that sort of, again, goes back to what everyone is dealing with every day of their life. And when you're feeling like things don't go your way or your team loses five nil or whatever it is, you're overlooked at work, but there's something where you realize, well, tomorrow can be 1% better. And to me, I think that that applies, you know, certainly to football, you know, you, 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 how you need to fall down. How is it that you get back up, but also day-to-day -day life? Because when you step away, you know, your team may win and you're on, you're, you're joyous on Monday, but you still got to get through that week, you know, if they're not playing on Tuesday. So, um, so we, we sort of stumbled into that again, Dan was someone who 
was really agreeable on camera. Um, Sam also, you know, I thought it was interesting that that we got footage of Sam sitting down. I think it was with who was who did he sit down with Ollie? Ollie Palmer? It was but it was someone else. Um, Vickers. Yeah. And and to to let a camera into that situation, listen, Ollie's going to let a camera into almost everything. Um, uh, but for Bickers to be there, he's a young guy, and and just to acknowledge that and and to understand that you know we know that there's sports psychologists out there every day, and I think it's it's important to get behind that and sort of shine a light on that. These are young young adults in put on stages where you know you see them when the microphone's in their face after a great victory. But there's a whole lot of other nuance to to getting through the day and and just fighting for your minutes on the field and and so you know that's a big thing. Again, it doesn't just shut off once the season ends. Yeah, I thought it, it was dealt with well because it's you know you take these these hot topics and it could almost be done in quite a contrived way. But I think the way it's reflected in people's real lives is what I say. This season for me, it had those moments where you know it hits you right there in the chest and you think, wow, this episode relates quite well i thought there was for me there was more of those in this season i think that was you know to the credit of you guys completely honestly you know if i can learn something or we can learn something too like i said that one percent thing you know i i call upon that all the time can tomorrow be one percent better you know i i think that's it appeals globally and it's and that's what makes this more to me more than just the traditional sports stock i love all the traditional sports stocks but again if there are people of all ages and 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 genders uh who are watching this and taking something away from it you know we're we're doing a little bit something extra which is which we're thrilled to do yeah and then just finally ref on this episode reflecting on the title knots again i mean obviously every protagonist needs an antagonist right <laughs> um and i think early on in that in, in this stage i think all of us thought it was going to be a case of oh christ here we go again uh these guys again but it was dealt with in quite a playful way as well I don't think you had any, yeah. any luck getting those guys from uh, from uh, what was the Notts County zone on, but <laughs> oh, I think was it wasn't that episode where we had our guy saying straight to camera like Disney Plus is wank. <laughs> I think that was it, and you know we we have to deal with our corporate overlords, which is Disney Plus, and it was, of course <laughs> when that goes through, you know, to the legal and S and P people, what's the first note we're going to get? Please take that out, and. <laughs> Man, I dug my heels in on that. I, you know, I talked to the people on the team. I said, "Don't worry, I'm going to fight on this." Come on, if you can't, if you can't laugh at yourself, and it happens again in other episodes. But yeah, so um, I kind of wish things went better for Knots because we did devote that time, and and they were near the top of the table at that point, or at the top of the table. So, but that's I think that's another lesson in you know things aren't always bright and, and sunny. So uh, we got lucky, you know, Josh uh, has a, had a relationship from the previous season. So was able to get on camera with, uh, get some of those players on camera, which came, I think in later episodes too. But um, yeah, again, this show just gifts us things with the, with the Knotts County zone, whoever that was. I'm glad you, you kept that moment in because that was a, a laugh out loud moment when the fan was shouting down the camera. <laughs> um, uh, so the next episode, the, risky business one um so one of the main themes for me about this is i guess the the fragility of wrexham's recovery if you could call it that you know in terms of the town i think it's reflected in in the title how would you go about telling the story of a town without actually being from wrexham yourself is that quite difficult um that's a testament to the people um who are actually there on the ground and who, you know, Rob goes over there a lot. I'm trying to remember, I think he's been over there like 28 times so far. So, you know, how how far into it is he getting? But, you know, we're again, going back to looking for stories, you know, we wanted to do a whole piece and sort of integrate the local taxi company. And we tried and it was tough because most of the rides people have are after the match and it's at night and how do we get cameras in the, but my point is, so we have a lot of boots on the ground. And so we're trying our best because, you know, we've got, you know, Rob doing his birthday gift to Ryan with the park. And so there are people who are trying to authentically identify places in the community that 
can be supported, that can be helped. And so that generally feeds back to us because we have sort of a wide net, a lot of people from, you know, the maximum effort side, you know, Ryan's company who's helping out with a lot of stuff. We have more better, which is Rob's company. We've got the club itself. And then we've just got the community who we're constantly reaching out to. So that's a little bit more like, we'll just get that from interviews, you know, from the, uh, um, the Zimbabwe woman who's lived there for a long time. And she has perspective that we don't know about. Yeah, so I, mean, I, think, I think it's sorry. Go ahead. No, no, go for it. Go for it. I was just saying it's. I think again, it's it's a testament to people who are out there trying to find out what's real, and hopefully we get that right. Yeah, definitely. Um, you know, I think there was some perspectives in there. You know, there's people I, I hadn't come across as well, which is quite almost refreshing, really, because it sort of challenges your own views of, I guess, where you live, which just makes you think on that. Um deeper level um there's also some insight into both a current player's business uh in terms of ollie palmer's business and um neil roberts bar as well um sort of yeah quite consistent theme in terms of one thing that i've seen in some reviews of um the documentary in terms of this one some people felt like there was a few bits in terms of you know like the commercial side deals say with like hp a bit sandwiched in but my take on that is that as well as being a documentary, this is also a commercial vehicle for Wrexham AFC. So you can't really completely get away without looking in, you know, looking into that side of things as well. Can you? No, you can't. And we, have, <laughs> we have, we have these calls with our story and our editorial Monday, Wednesday, Friday, 10 AM for months and months and months. And I'm a little bit more of a, uh, not pessimist with that. It's it's a necessary evil. Um, there are times when I call the show when I'm not too pleased. Welcome to HP. Um, <laughs> but it's just a joke. I'm, I'm all about the jokes. Um, so our goal always is to find an authentic way to do these integrations. And I keep using the word authentic. And if it can't be authentic, can we make it entertaining, right? And so I think one of uh, one of the ways I think we achieved that was the shooting of the commercial with Ollie, and he's got the office aligned in, a, in in the football formation. So at least that was something clever, and people sort of like behind the scenes things. So it's like, all right, that's a way to uh, to honor our sponsor and fulfill agreements and also entertain. Others are not as organic and we realize that. And so it's a constant, we are always looking for ways to do this where there's as little criticism as possible. And I, and I would love to say, and, and I'll tell you, I don't know if like I've signed non-disclosure agreements that if I'm revealing anything, but you know, front of kit you're united you're front of kit um to me you're already getting a nice placement but if we're doing a story about you know going flying the team to vegas all right you know we'll throw in a stock shot of united airplane it's part of the storytelling it's fairly organic you know um but there are other places where, like i said it's a little tougher um but that's but oh my point is so people know there are you know when they're sponsors that means money is going somewhere not a cent of sponsor dollars goes to support our show our show's budget is outside of that world so that's why it's really sensitive topic for us because to us we're really we're fortunate because if they don't support the club and the club cannot you know get these players on the pitch and we're not winning the show's not going so we're certainly aware of that but just to be clear, we don't get a nickel of that. So that's why it's a huge thing for us. And it's acknowledged. Thank you for noticing. And we'll do better next year. <laughs> now, I think my, my take on it personally as a fan is, you know, you've got to have an element of realism in it. Look, you know, look what, what's happened this week. We've just signed Arthur Conquo, a player, which a few seasons ago for Wrexham, not a chance in hell of signing. So you have to put your realistic hat on and say, well, how do these things happen? these things happen because we've got commercial deals with 
United Airlines, HP, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So I think that that's the opposite side to it for, um, for me. I would, I would like to use an example from season two, which was the Expedia integration, where we really worked hard because we knew we had to do that. And, and we found uh, that individual whose friend lived in India who happened to be uh, also a Wrexham fan, and we got to sort of reunite them. And I think that was sort of an interesting way of telling that story at the same time being a sponsor integration, but moving back to season three. Yeah, it's a difficult balance, but hey, it's got to be done. Um, the Just at the end of the episode, the man we've just mentioned, Afra Conquo. I just can't believe how many times it seems to happen where we, we've got a player who's doing really well and then bang, li- literally in this case, something just jumps up. I don't... It's crazy because you can't, you literally can't can't write it. The, what what's happened, particularly to Wrexham's goalkeepers, actually, because we've had it oh. previously, haven't we? It's just unreal how many times this happens. Yeah, again, a gift, a, a sad gift, you know. But in in hindsight, we'll take it. And you know, I like Arthur because there's something he too like he came in and in meeting him and in interviewing him, we realized this is a guy who's, I don't know if you could say happy go lucky, but you know, he was really agreeable for a young man and to go through what he went through. We're so thrilled to have him back. We're, we're already just, you know, salivating. So, but again, you would think, I, I think we all saw the hit. It was like, he seemed okay. You know, usually, you know, the keeper will go down and you're like, he's going to be fine, get up. And he's sort of spitting, but that's fine. He's going to be okay. And then you go, oh, shoot. And what I especially love is, you know, the Mark Howard story of it all. He's always, as we say in baseball, he's always in the bullpen warming up. You never know. And it's like, get back out there, Mark, you know, and then, okay, you know, you're off the pitch. We pull you off. So, um, I, I think his experience on this series and with this team is a really uh, representative of what professional sports especially is like, because you've got to be ready. You can't complain. He says it. He's like, I didn't think, you know, when we got Arthur, I don't think I needed to be benched, but that's not my decision. I'm not changing the gaffer's mind. So I just think the whole thing with the keeper situation, like you said, it just keeps it's gold. It's gold. And man, that shot, um, we tried really hard to track down like that 3D image of his jaw break, and you see, wow, how are you playing out there? Straight through, isn't it? Straight yeah. down from top to bottom. That's one another thing I quite like from a sports fan perspective about this series is there's some really great, you know, sort of behind the scenes stuff. Because I like you, like you say, I don't think I'd ever seen that um, image before. It's just the you know the level of detail that goes into it. Um, how did you actually get hold of that then? Did you just literally have to go through the club? Or... Um, yeah, I think we got through to Kev, through the trainer. Yeah. And again, it's really, I think there's, I don't, I don't know if you guys have HIPAA laws over there, but it's not just something you can track down immediately. You know, we, yeah. we had to go through and get a lot of permissions, but it was certainly worth it. Because again, when you're an editorial, you just put a placeholder in there that you find with stock footage. And when that thing came through, we were like, man, I think we, we used it a couple of times because it was, it was so talented. Yeah, worth the payoff, totally. Right, I'll hand you over um, to Tim now for the next couple of episodes. Yeah, I mean, the next one is a personal highlight and speaking to a lot of people. My favourite, my favourite. Yeah, I mean, Probably I think... All. Yeah. I think if if, you, if if somebody said to you, I've never seen Welcome to Wrexham, just you can only pick one to recommend, it would be temporary. And for those who might not be able to recall it, it's the one with Arthur Massey. It's the one with James Jones. Um, and largely kind of about the human condition, for want of a better term, really. Um, I mean, for me, I mean, I, I don't know what the other guys feel about this. And I don't know what, whether you'd agree, Jeff. For me, this episode, when I was watching it, it felt for me that this is the episode where, where you just knew that the club, absolutely implicitly trust what the documentary is doing because i think if you did ask the 100 100 year old man in episode in season one episode one can you tell us your story about the club if you did ask james jones 
can you tell us about all the stuff that's been going on in your private life and, and how, how emotionally tough it's been? If you'd asked those questions to those people then, I don't think you would have had a yes. But I think what, what I'm trying to get at is because of the way the documentary has is, is dealt with emotions on varying levels in such a heartfelt and commendable way, it's allowed these people to say, I'll, I'll tell you what you need to know. Now, I can't imagine you had any kickback from, from, from people at this juncture. So just take us through our episode because it was just joyous. It was joyous. And I think it can anybody who watched that, whether you're a sports fan or not, can resonate with it because we've all got stories. We've all got memories of, of supporting a, a club, whether it's football, baseball, whatever. So to be able to get a guy like Arthur Massey you know, on the eve of his sort of hundredth birthday, and the fact, that the ironic thing about the whole episode being called temporary, there's nothing temporary about his memory. He can recall everything: his favourite players, the games, the times where you know, kind of jumpers for goalpost era stuff. I mean, what was your overriding thought? I mean, you must have elements of severe pride when when you see the finish that episodes and i imagine that has to be up there yeah that one for sure uh, again it, it it takes you outside the traditional sports talk and ap appeals to society as a whole um we i'll speak for america is that there are different cultures a lot of our cultures discard the elderly they do not take, you know, once you've, you've sort of retired and your voice is not respected, it's discounted. You look in other cultures and, and grandparents are highly revered. And so I think this is an, an opportunity to remind people that a centrogenarian has these experiences, has still life left in them. There's hope. Um, that reminds us that I love it when Arthur says, not everything's going to go your way. You know, and, and if there's anyone who can say that, it's him. Um, I mean, we love that man so much. And, and we were, you know, there were times, I'll go back to the Arthur story and the James Jones story. They were in earlier episodes. And if you, I remember, as I recall, we had to step outside of our timeline for the Arthur story because we had to get him to, the Tranmere match and uh, FX who broadcasts, who is our main uh, broadcaster here. Those are the executives who we deal with. They are sticklers for timeline. If you look, we almost overdo it sometimes. We have to remind everyone where we are in that episode, where the team is in the table, where we are in the season, and we're constantly reminding people. But because of the Arthur story, we had to go out of time sequence a little bit and we had fun with it also. Um, and we knew when his birthday was. We knew that we needed to get him in. I believe that was Rob's idea, was to get him sitting in the cop by himself to end that episode. And Arthur was sick for a, a long time. And usually you don't come back from that at that age. And we were really worried. And then his daughters would say like, no, he's doing better. Now we're sick. Um, so we really wanted that, you know, we, we had him, and again, that was Rob's idea, I believe, unless someone gave him the idea to give him the 100 seconds of applause um, at that match. And so we had that in the can, but we really needed that last shot of him. And it took months and months, and your damn Welsh weather would not agree. Arthur would feel better, and it'd be time to get out to the cop. And it's like, nope, it is downpour. Um, but that was something we knew very early on, like the early cuts of that was like, this is going to be somewhere in the show. It's so good. And I would share it with people who had nothing to do with the show. Just like, hey, um, I need to show you something that will give you the feels. So the Arthur thing was, hands down, this is happening. It's just, are we going to get the ending that we want? And and hopefully, is he going to stay healthy? Um, and then the James Jones story. I mean, to me, we had had that footage from the match the previous year. I mean, think about that. If you're pulled off the pitch in the middle of a match to say, you know, and the fact that we captured that where 
where Phil's saying, you know, hey, your old man's here and something's wrong to pull you off. And the, again, you couldn't make that up in the middle of a match. And then he and Chloe, Chloe is that his wife's name? Um, James' yeah. wife, uh, they were so open. And at first, I know they were a little resistant. It, it goes back to the, the crew on the ground to have that level of trust and to share their story. Um, I mean, and here's the biggest thing. Because of time, that piece was cut. And there are a few of us who got down on our hands and knees and said, please let us put this back in. Please let us go a little bit longer. And I was like, yeah, we'll see, try it back in. And to me, that with Josh and Brian, um, really fighting for that was is one of my prouder moments of this, that we were able to get that back in. Because again, I was showing that piece to just random people who would come to my house, people would go through my office, I'd say, can you please watch this? Tell me that I'm wrong. And they'd be like, this needs to be in your show. They may have no context of anything else. So that was huge. And it was also important, you know, one of the points that we made to the the people, because I'm not going to name names, who said, ah, I don't know if it fits, was they had opened themselves up so much to us that it could jeopardize future stories that we wanted to do about players and families. And so, um, it worked out and everyone ultimately agreed and, and, and it's on screen. One of the other things that was disappointing was we really wanted to have a card up that um, drove people to a, a donation page because James really wanted to give back to the different facilities and other people going through what they had gone through um, as just sort of a place to for people to donate. And because of legalese, we couldn't put that card up. There's different rules in the states and overseas. So we worked really hard. I worked really hard with uh, the social media people to to get some postings. So hopefully some money's going back to those institutions and the people. I can't imagine dealing with that on a daily basis. And that little kid giving us the giving us the smiles. Oh and, and, unbelievable. And getting, you know, and that was something listen, things you can call it produced, you know, but to put them in the stands for Arthur's birthday and to have Arthur come face to face with this young child. I, I mean, I'm sorry, let's produce that. Let's put them in the same place because it ties it all together. Yeah. hundred percent. hundred percent. You mentioned to Liam earlier on, uh, obviously the, the, the knots again um, episode and there was, there was some stuff that Josh did um, that maybe didn't quite make that one, but it was, I don't want to say bolted on, but it, it was included in this episode as well. There was a lot of footage with um, Luke Williams, uh, Macaulay Langstaff, a few of the other players. I suppose it kind of did tie in with the whole temporary thing because obviously you know, Notts County had undergone, undergone a lot of changes at that moment in time as our kind of main adversaries from the season before. Um I think a few people were like, "Well, do we need, do we need to keep going on about Notts County?" But do you feel that there, that that was probably about the right amount to give Notts in that particular episode because because of, of what happened the season before and because it tied in with the whole theme of, oh, we've now lost our manager, and you know, we, they they couldn't have foreseen how far they dropped down the table. Um, but it was it was quite a it tied in with the old overarching theme of it. Yeah, we try. I mean, we, we look for these themes. Sometimes it's a little tougher to make those connections. Uh, you know, we all have our opinions. You know, do I, did I think we needed that much knots? Maybe, maybe not. Um, I think to me what it did serve, though, going back to the temporary, is, is that could be us. That could be Wrexham. Because they were at the height of heights the previous year, and they have these players that are equivalent of our players. And look how this sport treats you and that could be us and are you going to stick around are those knots friends just as passionate you know how is life mid table it's not so fun i i especially liked how open the players were too like i said i think josh yeah josh did those interviews and um and really able to t and talking to luke and you know we're lucky phil could have got plucked by another team 
and and yeah. and be gone and then you're resetting so yeah i i think it fits the theme of temporary and it just reminds you that even though you're watching a a produced show about a football club it doesn't always go your way that could be us in season four man yeah and it comes back to what i said at the start in terms of the the, the faith and trust in a documentary to, to have players and management of another club saying okay you know, I'd, I'd love to know how many people have sat down and go, can I check that first? What are you going to do? I imagine for the most part, people would be going, I've watched it. I know what you do. I know you're not there to throw us in the buses. So, you know, we'll sit down. Yeah, I mean, we, we look at this going back to sort of a career as a marathon when you're going to have highs and lows. It's also like we want these relationships. We don't want to be one and done. We want to be able to look at these, you know, these clubs that are now in League One and have them, if they go back and watch it, they, I don't expect them to, but just have them understand that, yeah, sure, we we may have, we may not be completely objective, but we're respectful of other people's lives, of their stories, and we, we fight, you know, I talk about these instances where certain things have been cut and we fight to put them back in, you know, that, you know, we're still a group of people who, who are proud of what we're doing. We don't want to just be you know, trumpeting the company line because, you know, all this could come to an end. We know, we know this every, you know, season three, this could be it. And what do we do after that as, as producers or, or as editors, as storytellers? So, you know, this is also a bit our legacy and it's what we're really lucky to have all the attention on us and, and it helps you in your career. But um, people are going to go back and look at that and see like, well, how did you treat these other people? And, we want this to keep going and going and going and going. Like this is one of the best thing that's ever happened professionally for me and for this group of people. That's the other you you look at, like I say, consistency to a man and woman. I could say almost everyone wants to come back to this show. I think that speaks to sort of the culture of the club, but it also speaks to the culture of what we're doing. We love what our what we're doing. We try and give there's no bad ideas. You know, we, we there's sort of the uh, the metaphor of crew, right? You can have all the strongest people, but if you're not rowing in the same cadence, you're not going to get there faster. And we have a lot of people who have different areas of expertise. And when we're all rowing in cadence, man, it's a smooth ride, and we're you know out ahead of everybody else. And so, yeah, being honoring people and and being respectful of their story and and looking ahead to. Hey, what are we going to do next year? And we're going to we're going to need to, our reputations are going to speak for that. Before I bring Andy in to sort of go over go over the final two episodes of the season, um, far away, so close. It was like if 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 one feel good episode wasn't enough, let's give mm -hmm. you another one. So we had a bit of a a history lesson with the Patagonia thing and, and getting David and a few a few of the the guys over. Um, how was that? I, I really enjoyed that because it, it served as a reminder of the kind of the global appeal that the club now has and continues to have. But also, I think it, it, it's. I'd love to know how. I'd love love to know how much screen time Rob and Ryan have had across the entire third season because I can't imagine it's that much. You know, I genuinely don't imagine it's that much at all. Um, and it's the same for this. It was like, well, oh. It was kind of nice that let, let's just just remind everybody how invested these guys are, and for for Rob to come over when the chips were a little bit down, give because you can give you can give like pep talks and and, and kind of feel good texts, and, but for him to come in, go straight into the dressing room and right, come on, let's uh, let's get you guys over the line was was really nice and it wasn't too over the top. You could have you could you could have you could have done the producing from the moment he gets. Leaves his house, gets on the plane, gets off the plane, because like you said, with thirty-eight, forty times he's been over. You really could have made the meal of of how big of an effort it is to get over to these matches. So for him to come over and give everybody a massive, massive uh, boost was was nice to watch. I think. Yeah, we have the same. Again, shame on the EFL for making all of us on the west coast of the United States get up at 7 a.m. every freaking Saturday morning to care about League Two football. And so that's that's the thing about this is we're not, there are other shows you work on and it's a job, 
but this now we're also fans we're just like all of you and so we're thinking the same thing rob ryan when are you going to get over there we're thinking it as fans but we're also thinking it as producers like get over there and you know when things were really bad sometimes you know you don't want to talk when things are bad so i think that was the episode where we had them sort of self-recording uh, on their phones and we pushed them hard on that like guys things are going wrong you're not around we need you to speak about this and so you know they they agreed and you know they give us this footage of and, and no one's prompting them there that's just them speaking into their phones where we're like how are you feeling in these times uh where where things aren't going the way they're going so you know we were thrilled from a producing standpoint when rob decided to go over there you know ryan was buried deep in deadpool um but yeah they, they care about this team deeply and they recognize that they hadn't been over to a lot of matches at that point and it's i mean did it make a difference it seemed like it you know the results are the results um and then when it comes to the episode as a whole you know, we knew we were very early on, we knew that certain players might be called up to their national teams. And I think for a beat, we thought Paul might be, that was sort of a last minute decision. You know, we have so much, we cover him so much. So when Jacob got the call up, we were waiting for that. And we know that we, you know, to go to Africa, uh, I think that was really important for us. Um, that was something that we had to, really put together at the last minute there was a i don't know if you heard the story did you we had to cut this out of the episode but when jacob went to i think they were playing the ivory coast but i think he went to the gambia and the team was flying to the tournament and the plane they loaded these guys on a plane that was not the best plane and basically after like 10 minutes guys were passing out and <sighs> Pilot was smart enough to turn around and go back and land and like they were in peril and we had footage of them you know Jacob passed out and just basically something was wrong with the pressure on the plane and the oxygen and the guys were passing out and if they had gone another like 10 minutes the story would have been a lot worse but we couldn't we couldn't fit that in you know and they went back to Gambia and then took a different flight but imagine going to a match and it's going to be the time of your life, everything you've dreamed of, and you have this really harrowing experience on a flight, but we couldn't fit that in. Um, and of course, we'd had the James McLean piece about Ireland. That had been in different episodes, and we knew we had to get that in. We love that guy so much. And, you know, again, he opened up, his family opened up about their experiences. There was a certain chant that um, <laughs> you guys know. And so sometimes we have to play the political game a little bit so we gave sort of the preamble to what the actual chorus was and we let the people know you can look it up what the real chant is so um yeah i had a text i had a text i had a text from season where's the rest of it it's like you know what yeah. it is anyway it doesn't matter you know what it is and so and i think we had the prince was in that episode right yeah, yeah. so we had certain a certain audience that we had to respect um yeah. so but yeah we like you know it's a global it's a global game and to go to all these places and, and understand how important it is and again it was so great to to see jacob there um we had to make some trims for time but it's just a different flavor wherever you go but you just see the universal appeal jeff i'm a bit conscious of time uh, have you got another 10 minutes just to just to go through the last yeah i'm all devoted to you yes i'm all devoted oh. to you no music to our ears um basically the proper trouble um you, you've mentioned him but for me the sort of the best part of that was the james mclean stuff because you know going back about about what he's what he's dealt with in, in coming from Derry and and the sort of criticism he's, he's had over here for for his his right his beliefs i think for for james i think it's quite nice to come to a club where straight away he's absolutely accepted and I think we had that chant that we will not name. It's the fucking king. Uh, uh, in you know, we we were singing that after after about a, a match. I think we've really taken to him. But can you tell straight away when a guy comes in? Yes, he's he's a guy we want to get around. He's he's like a, an interesting an interesting character. 
I think someone who helped us with that was Humphrey, because he has a sense of that. I think, you know, we, we talk about in the episode how they knew the quality of play that that James brought to the pitch. But was it the controversy associated with him? Is that something that you can bring into the locker room? I think it speaks to, you know, the culture in the locker room. Um, but going back to, yeah, we were we we're sort of given a heads up early on that this is someone who I think it's also a point where he's a certain point of his career. He's on the sort of the, the end of it. We knew he was going to be ending his uh, international play. So that was, we were always flagging that very early on in the season. We thought we could tie that in with, with Mendy having his first cap and James having his last cap. Um, and just knowing that going back to where he is in his career, like he, he's clearly spoken his mind already and you see him play on the pitch and you see that's probably a guy who has something to say or is someone um, to shine a light on. And again, I think we had a little bit of a heads up from Humphrey about him. But again, you watch that guy, you watch him run and run and run and run and run. And you go like, I, I want to know a little bit more about him. No, no. We've taken him to our heart pretty, pretty early doors. Now, the last one. Um, did it even take you guys by surprise that we actually won it against Forest Green? And was there a, a big plan in for Stockport with, with, with Rob and Ryan coming over that would that have to be shelved because we did it a week early? Dude, there, there were so many people who had plans for that Stockport match going back months and months and months. Um, and the forest screen, I, I will say one of one of our proudest achievements is our graphic outlining what needed to happen that day um, and sort of explaining to people who may not understand all the nuances in the sport. And uh, we love that graphic with the chalkboard saying, here's what's got to happen here. And then these people have to win and all that. Go back and watch that, everybody. Um, but so, no, we were not prepared. And I think. For us, that was a Saturday morning game, right? I think that was a Saturday yeah. morning, Saturday afternoon for you guys. Free and so we'll, we'll have these text chains with, which, with a lot of us on the show, because again, it's 7 a.m. here, we're not all together. And, um, and man, the text chain was blowing up that day with people sort of chiming in like, you know, MK Dons is up. Oh no, now they're down. Oh great, you know, at least we came out of the gate so fast there, but no, we didn't have that expectation. And, you know, and, and Forrest Green had, sort of taken it to us before. So we didn't have any sort of assumptions, you know, in our minds, what's going to happen with this team is they're going to take us down to the last day every time. And we're, are we going to be in playoffs? Are we not? I mean, we were doing that dance the whole time going, this team's going to end up in fourth. We know they're going to end up in fourth and we're going to try and produce this show because we, we knew when we premiered. So if we went into the playoffs, that was just going to crush us from a, a production and producing standpoint to, make our air date. So we were thrilled. We knew, you know, how are we going to tell the story? But I think what it allowed us to do, which was a gift, was to honor some of those people like Luke yeah. um, and Ben and, and give them their proper, I mean, we would even like to give them a little bit more of a, a, a send off, but at least acknowledge like how integral they were to getting us to where we are right now. So it afforded us that it afforded us the opportunity. We knew like, all right, let's set up Stockport for season four. Cause at that point, I think we knew we'd have a season four order and just sort of jump into that storyline a little bit. And I can't remember, did, did the banner end up in or not the banner that they always fly? Did, did that end up in the episode? Yeah. Yeah. They have a knack for doing though, yeah. that. So, so let's, let's, uh, let's build up a rivalry, you know? Yeah. That's what I was going to say. Um, to, to, season four has been commissioned, so a couple of things around that. You know, you talked about your, your, your whiteboard earlier about where things might go. Do you have an early idea of of where you might want to push season four? And then the other thing is, when would it come out? Are you going to keep to the same sort of format that you did this season, or could it even come out earlier? This is this is just me hypothesizing. So where where we start out? Well, you know, we know we have the summer tour of the men and the women. So that's going to be something that um, we'll certainly cover. Um, 
there's there's a little surprise that we shot so i'll have to leave that as it is that that we know um you know the, the guys go back to vegas um i'll say but what happens to the women uh the, the people at home when the guys are off at vegas um when it comes to the release date i think that's going to go back to uh what the efl rules are my my guess my educated guess is it'll probably be we probably can't legally come out until after the playoffs are done so beginning of june is my guess okay if we, if we can go earlier but we're, we're, we won't go back to the fall i think this was something we demonstrated where we can keep up with what's happening uh on the pitch and um yeah i would i would anticipate a june thing although what that comes back to is what is you know fx the main broadcaster here on the states what they say because there's those elements of when people disappear for the summer and go off on a holiday you know can we get enough episodes released and ready before everyone sort of pieces out over here but that's my guess um jeff uh, we we usually do like a little quick fire thing and it, it's usually it's based towards a footballer but we're, we're going to do it with, with you and your sort of experiences of who you've had on welcome to Wrexham and how it's sort of come together so just uh, as a quick fire who's the most skillful and what i'm what i probably mean by that in this context is the interviewer you like to the interviewee you like to sit down with and always gives you always gives you the gold um well i want to say steve you know from, from the start um i'm trying to think who else someone who just sort of i'm i'm like a james i will say yeah. i'd like to see james mclean again um yeah i gotta keep thinking Okay, the next one I think might actually be Steve Parkin. Who's the worst dressed? <laughs> or best dressed? Oh. Who's the worst? Um, well, I only see them, you know, like in the footage. I'm trying to think, but but that would make Steve the best dressed. You know, that's it's it's all subjective. Who's the worst dressed? Uh, well, certainly me in the office, shorts and t-shirts <laughs> all the time. I'll own that. Everyone will support that. Um, right. Next one is who's the most underrated? Are you talking about football? Some of your, yeah. Or well, oh, it could be some one of your backroom team, that sort of thing. Oh, who do I want to? I mean, who's underrated? I think Mark Howard's underrated. Okay. Is there anyone in the team that, uh, you know, maybe behind the scenes at Welcome to Rexham who does, does a great job and maybe doesn't get the plaudits? Oh man, I I think it's the entire crew in, in in Wrexham. Like you guys may see them firsthand. Um, it, like it's it's the entire team. I keep saying Patty's name, but there's Charlie and there's Claire and there's Marta, and there's Laura and there's Tom and there's Gaz and there's Joe. I mean, it's a whole team. It, it really is, you know. And people say like you stand on the shoulders of other people, and and sometimes. You know, I'm standing on shoulders of people. Sometimes people are standing on my shoulders. Uh, I, I can't tell you how much, you know, what I will say, I'll say our editorial team. Um, they yeah, do the editing stuff. is particularly good, yeah. I mean, there are people who are on our team, and we've been fortunate, who are off doing, you know, Marvel movies. There are people who are off doing shows like The Voice, and we all come together on this, and, and it all is just like a, a really sweet uh, uh, love fest. Sorry, I didn't answer that as one person who's underrated, but yeah. That, that's fine, mate. That's fine. Right. Okay. This is a bit bit strange. Uh, we do, right. Who's the biggest moaner? And what we mean by that is someone who sits there and moans in the, in the dressing in the dressing room. I'm wondering how we can adapt this to, 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 to your sort of context. But um, right. How, how do we do that? Is it who's Dude, the that's... person who, who, I don't know, maybe has gets a bit emotional about it? I don't know it's all of us we <laughs> we are we we all support each other i'm sorry to, to be so vague but if you're talking about the, the producing side you know it can be me like i can just be you know whinging it it, it alternates though because because we are really are like like i said there, there's josh and there's brian and, and and but the whole group of us we just have these calls and 
and you know 70 percent of it is productive and the rest is is moaning it, it really is like, and that's yeah. what's great about this show i i i cannot be it's so i'm so fortunate and all the people around me I, um I, this is my chance to like do my uh my acceptance speech you know i love colette and, and and jenny over at the network like these are people who really care about the show they're so invested um they really let us do our thing but they're also close collaborators but moaning i mean how much can you moan about this 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 whole thing has been a gift you know like, like how can i moan about this no all right this is a bit easier uh I would, which person would you least like to fight arthur i couldn't okay. get close to the guy guy's I got reach got a jaw, you know say again I've heard he's got a suspect jaw. That's true. If I could reach it, how could I reach it? I'm trying. I'm wait, but there's some, probably some other bulldogs out there too. James, I mean, look at that guy, that barrel chest, and he just keep going. Yeah, but I'm a lover, not a fighter. Um, final thing from me: um, Did you think it would be as big as it has been? Not at all. I, I I think what what we really crossed over from being a a follow sports doc series to something again, like I said, people who, when I very early on, when it was hard to get Wrexham swag, anything, and I would be say down at the beach and I'd be wearing a Wrexham hat and there would be random people saying, where did you get that? How can I get that? So not at all. You know, we've, we've got a, a match against Bournemouth in, uh, in Santa Barbara next month. And I just happen to know a few people in Santa Barbara who I haven't had contact with in a, in a while and they've just come out of the woodwork and they're not asking for anything they're just asking like will i be up there and it's just a way to connect with people people who i've worked with colleagues over the years who have reached out to me and it's really this show has provided me a lot i've been very fortunate like i said but this show and and the the recognitions it's got let's go back and look at sunny Six, I, can't, I don't even know we've done 16 yeah we're going into the 17th season I think we got a nomination once for a stunt where a guy fell down the stairs, like in the stunt category, nothing else ever. So we gave up on this a long time ago. You know, the biggest revenge is getting picked up for another season. The accolades are great, but you want the work. You know, you can have an Emmy sitting on the wall. It's not going to give you a call time. Um, yeah. So the fact that it's gone like this and a lot of us, we, we, again, we all know, or I hope people know, like this is all going to come to an end one day. So enjoy it while you can. And the fact that it's got so large, and I, I'm talking to you guys, you know, as, as I told you before, I'm thrilled. I'll, I'll talk all day about this. I was thinking about this before I got on with you. I'm like, huh, when should I write the book? You know, I get all the people, how, how long removed from when this thing ends is the book appropriate? And there's yeah. so many stories that, like you guys are very aware of that are on the cutting room stove on the cutting room floor and and in the backstories that um that people are interested in but you know i i love this show um i will ride this wave as long as i can i i, I thank the people of rexham i thank you guys being fearless in your devotion uh let's you know as long as we can ride this thing and yeah there will be ups and there will be downs and, and hopefully we can cover them in like i said an authentic way but um i'm a fan you know i i this gets me up in those saturday mornings i don't know why you know 46 matches later i'm like what why was i living and dying like that like what i'm just a guy in california it's an ocean away right yet somehow my week is determined by what happens on that pitch and um and that's what's great about sports man I'm, yeah. you know be able to mix these two things. No, you're right. You're right. Um, Jeff, your IMDB page is not wrong. Uh, you do like a chat, uh, but we've absolutely loved having you on. And thank you so much for your time. Um, any last questions for, for Jeff before we let him go? <laughs> Jeff, the fixtures are out on Wednesday. Who would you like to see first game of the season? Birmingham City. Oh, hey. Home or away? Home. Right. Get TB12 out there. We will open, Rob and Ryan will open that Betty Buzz suite. We will roll out the red carpet and we'll kick that man right back to um, uh, 
I just forgot the the show. Um, oh yeah, um, I forgot. Oh, yeah, Peaky Blinders. There we go. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, that I think there should be a bet there that if if uh, if Birmingham City beats us, everyone gets Peaky Blinders cuts. Huh? Wow. Okay. You guys don't Strong. think so? All right, that's fine. Anyway, so Tim, Tim dresses up as Peaky Blinders, don't you, Tim? Do I? I'm sure I've seen you in cosplay. As uh, I've, I've done it in the past, like during like the second season, I dressed up as Alfie Solomon's. I, I don't do the cap thing because all the all the race goers still do that. It's a bit weird. But, uh, yeah. Yeah. No, I dressed up as a very angry, angry Jewish baker. It's great. I don't know if you guys saw if if you're aware over there, but they did a big roast of Tom Brady over here recently. That was a huge thing on Netflix, and I knew some of the comedians who were going to roast him. And I almost was texting them, being like, "You got to bring up his club," but I left it alone. I figured they had enough. I think Bill there. Belichick did, didn't didn't he? I, I did not see that part. If he did, that's um, great. Of course he did. Um, that's right. going to make good TV, isn't it? It's going to it's going to make good TV for the for the for the season four. Tom Brady. Oh, we are salivating for that. I, I hope yeah. those matches are live up to the hype. That's for sure. I'm so I'm so excited to see who we bring in. Like I said, getting Arthur. That seemed like something unattainable before. So we're off and running already. Right. This has been a marathon pod, but I've enjoyed every single minute of it. Um, as Tim said, the fixture is out on Wednesday. We might just do a mini uh, a mini pod on that as well because um, we didn't have, get much chance to talk about them today. But we've gone through so much. Really enjoyed it. Thanks so Here's, much for your time. I'm not gonna I'm not gonna let you go yet. Here's something that we're looking at also is you know other clubs. There are certain clubs that don't provide us access. You know, oh. we're only as good as as the cooperation. So what we hope is in this in this new league that the clubs will cooperate and give us access because they don't have to let our crew in there. And um, there's a certain... Any, any, any specific clubs you want to name? Are there clubs that rhyme? Like that me? Me? I, I need to check my NDA, but there's a specific club that I was thrilled did not get promoted because they were one of the teams that did not give us access and they wanted us to pay a bunch of money. And we said, we, we can't, like I said, we don't have that money. And they got very, very far in the process, and then they get to enjoy another year of League Two. So have fun down there. We're, we're going to end on that, but really, what we're going to do is end it so we can ask Jeff who it was as soon as we've stopped recording. <laughs> yeah, well, you got, I need to see the stop recording light go. <laughs> All right, we're going to stop recording now. Thanks, guys. Thanks for everything. See you next week. Cheers. Cheers. Thanks, guys.